to say tonight. You will recall that the Mass was the third Sunday of um, Easter time and we heard the Gospel of the walk to Emmaus and how the disciples had not first recognised the risen Christ walking alongside them and only as if they, their eyes were opened at the moment when uh, their stranger guest at supper broke the bread. What I, I took my cue from was an opening quote from the, from the Mass which I, I quoted from uh, Simone Veil and the words I used at the start of Mass were just the first line of this quote. She said, or wrote, with imagination you don't have to travel far to find God. And so in my introduction to Mass I was just making the connection between the fact, the very real fact, that we're not currently able to travel very far at all unless we've got particular and pressing business to attend to which is uh, acceptable to the wider society and that includes not currently being able to access our places of worship, our churches, the places we associate most obviously and understandably with uh, God. So I was saying that um, it's, a, it's a comforting thing to be reminded of the fact that it is not just in churches, of course, where God is present to us, although we do truly believe that the, the Lord is present in the, um, the, 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 the Blessed Sacrament, uh, truly sacramentally present uh, in, in our uh, churches and in the tabernacle, the place where we would come to pray at quiet moments as we also gather for our Eucharistic celebrations. So there's comfort in that, that we can access God and God can access us everywhere. But I'm going to then continue. This is what I did with the, with the homily that unfortunately didn't come across at all clearly. So just to give the full quote. With imagination, you don't have to travel far to find God. Only notice things. She goes on. For the finite and the infinite live in the same place. It is here alone at this precarious and vital point that the holy secret is laid bare. She concludes this section. And so I live in this world by attention. So she's got this gift for not just going through life without noticing what's occurring, as they say in, in Wales. She, she, she sees deeper perhaps than is the case for many of us it's as if we've left behind our capacity that we had in childhood to perceive a deeper level of reality we get caught up in the humdrum of daily life but she's saying the finite and the infinite live in the same place so just as god is dwelling in the eucharistic elements in church so god dwells within us in our own homes within the sacramental uh, situation of a married couple for instance but also in our baptism all of us baptized sacramental presences of god wherever we are she also i was interested in this at the precarious and vital point i mean well, that's where we are aren't we we're living sub, uh, simultaneously in a precarious time um, we're anxious about what's going on, uh, things we cannot be on our control, um, things that even experts don't seem to have a handle on at this moment and politicians are struggling to come up with appropriate policies and provide the, the right equipment etc etc. Precarious times but simultaneously there are, it's, it's a vital time, not in the vital as necessary but vital as in alive. People are discovering 
about themselves, things which had perhaps been under the surface for a while. We're discovering gifts we've got, discovering relationships we have. We're discovering capacity for inventiveness, creativity, resourcefulness. So it's a vital time as it is a precarious time. And it's here, she suggests, in these kind of situations that the holy secret is laid bare as if that which we're yearning for in faith is actually brought closer to us at times like this. So the thing is for us all to try and live with greater attention to what's going on. It was in this context that I, 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 I began to speak about someone. And I want to speak about someone who is of this place, our community here, Blatchford, Grappen Hall, and the surrounding area, Warrington. Um, so our place, but also someone who is of our community, not currently living in the community, but most certainly of our community. So let me begin like this. Back in 2009, some of you may recall that we held a, a service of dedication and blessing on the site where the church now stands. We, we held a service in which we estimated where the altar would be, the tabernacle would be, the amber would be, the font would be, the welcome area would be. And we blessed those areas. We had a specific prayer to try and focus on what those areas would be to us once our new church was up and running. And as part of that ceremony, I invited a number of parishioners, just representatives really of different uh, constituencies, so, so to speak. And one of the people who, who and they were digging up just a turf of, uh, you know, of the, of the ground, a sort of a ceremonial, first um, turf being being dug, first sod of soil. Before the contractors moved in, I think the very next day. And one of the people who, who, who dug a sod of oil on our behalf, uh, that very September began his studies at Cambridge University, from where he three years later emerged with a first class honours degree. Subsequently he continued his education by taking an MA followed very swiftly by a PhD, a doctorate at Liverpool University and is currently doing some postdoctoral research based in Dublin but also taking him um, to other places. Meanwhile he's been writing poetry I believe for quite some time began when he was a, a younger student at school and uh, he's just had published some of his poetry um, he's been really rather well received he had a Facebook launch because they couldn't have a, a proper um, launch the other day in terms of everybody being in the same room press conference and the like and he also appeared on the um, front row program on, uh, the show, uh, on Radio 4 so he appeared he was part of that program so his material is clearly being uh, recognised by some as having a quality which is deserving of our attention. Um, and that's the point, attention again. If you read, and I'll give you the name, it's Sean, Sean Hewitt, if you read his poetry, you'll discover in a man who's, well I don't know his precise age, but I'm guessing late 20s, uh, just, yeah, yeah, I won't go any, I won't go any higher, Sean, late, later 20s now. as yet perceived, I imagine from a very early age, um, his love of nature is, is, is absolutely um, present in, his, in all his writings, his, his perception of a, of a sort of a depth and an, an, inner, a, um, an inner communication that's, that's available to us in, in where we're in, out and about in, in, in nature. But at the same time as, as, as beautifully conveying his, his, his relationship, shall I put it that way, with, with nature, he's also done something utterly courageous to my mind. He's incorporated within his poetry um, 
let me say confessional, not in a churchy way, but in a tent and a way of just acknowledging aspects of life where there's been a struggle. Now it happens to be a struggle that all of us in some form or other have to go through, especially in our teenage years when the hormones are um, coursing through our veins. We're discovering ourselves, our bodies change and uh, we, we, we find ourselves who we are attracted to and, and, um, and uh, we maybe uh, engage in some sort of uh, experiment to discover more about that side of our, of our nature. And it's all about moving towards accepting, receiving, celebrating, enjoying, living the gift of human intimacy, which is a gift from God. Sometimes narrowly interpreted by certain people in, 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 in churches and religious communities as being purely about procreation. But no, it's a gift that is part of ourselves and part of how we communicate with one another and particularly those to whom we are drawn into uh, intimate relationship. Please God, lifelong uh, partnerships. But Sean, uh, as I say, very um, courageously, um, and I say that with no hesitation or, or caveats at all, uh, shared in his poetry in quite candid detail in some, to some eyes, ears, his own struggles with coming to terms with his sexuality and being attracted to uh, those of the same sex and his, his experimentation and his, his seeking some sort of way of finding his way to, to living, um, uh, expressing his, his, his nature and his, his um, attractiveness or attraction to men, etc. And he does that with the same candidness, the same observation the same attention to detail, the same insight into what's going on. I say insight, it's also the questions are still alive. They're not, they're not answered. He's not the sort of person who would presume to, 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 to my reading, who want to give a definite answer to things. But he's, he, 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 but the beautiful thing is Sean has this magical, I know he uses that term, way of bringing together these two aspects of observation, observation of how he perceives nature and observation of how he perceives uh, him, himself to, to be. Now, I'm going to pause there. Yeah, supper is being prepared and I forgot I put the timer on a piece of chicken. So Sean has done, has written this poetry He's also incorporated, and again, this is incredibly uh, uh, courageous, but also magnificently, um, uh, magnificently delivered um, reflections on the experience, not just his own personal life. I, I, I think he's, 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 he's voiced the experience of his family. He's found a way as an individual of, 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 of bringing the, the whole experience of the loss of their, their dad, so tragically, uh, last year. But, but returning to the poetry and the way of introducing his his own um, emerging sense of who he is, the integrity of his life as a, as a, as a, as a, as a person, um, with his 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 lifelong um, uh, sense of presence in nature, he, he writes this poetry. And so I, I did read tonight, and I want to read to you a section of one of his poems, and it's called um, "Petition." Now, the beautiful thing in this poem. To me is the way he draws these two together. Um, I, I, there isn't a commentary from Sean with the, with the poem so I'm going to have to try and give some sort of sense of a interpretation to it but it begins with him going into this. I, I'm still guessing kind of a wooded area because a lot of what it's weeks about it takes place in wooded areas at twilight but he, he goes into this but there's clearly a pool that he's familiar with a place he goes to and so it's a place of uh, where he retreats to, like we do, we've got places we go where we're trying to work something out. I, Sean, at one stage in life, I, I guess, this pool, I, I get drawn to water too. Um, but he goes, and, and what's beautiful, again, the observation, he, he, he doesn't just sort of go and dip his toe in or um, just look along the bank. He, he, he gets down, you know, when, when animals come to drink from the water at the side, it's that sort of crouching, you imagine, the way he describes it. And he's, he could observe a sort of um, um, uh, almost duck level what's going on around including the fishermen opposite 
Um, but then then it occurs to his mind either at the time or subsequently in connection with this experience in the uh, in the pool where he's come to sort of understand himself better accept himself better perhaps love himself but while he's there or, or subsequently as I say he's, he recalls a visit to Lords. He, he obviously went on a pilgrimage to Lords, and, and this is where the poem takes up I'd like to read this if I may Remembering, of course, that Lords is associated with water. Great, very cold water that comes down from the Pyrenees. Once I queued for the baths at the sanctuary of Lords, was sent to a room full of frail men undressing. Just a damp white curtain between us and the icy water rising up from the carved pole. The deep chant of a Latin rosary, how a French voice called to me, two men inside, a crucifix on the wall above the stone bath my towel taken off. I was given instead a sheet of cotton to wrap around myself as though to reassure me that I could be loved when all my parts were bound together. All I can remember now is being held one hand on my chest another pressed to my back, the slow meeting of water over my body, how the rhythm of the voices and the river seemed to reassemble my life around me. Anybody who's been to Lords would recognise or has, has, has submitted themselves to the chilling experience of the baths will recognise that scene. The, 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 the sort of matter of factness of the changing rooms, um, no, no sort of privacy really at all. Um, even then, the, you know, the, the, these burly or these, these volunteers doing the actual ducking of people under are a very slapdash about it, a very matter of fact, you sort of take your towel off and you wrap this um, piece of cloth around you. And I just love the way Sean talks that, I mean, it's almost like the, 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 the simultaneously that uh, our right, body's being exposed and then, yeah, we've got to, you know, this is the Catholic thing, got to wrap it all up again and, and, and um, my parts, I can be loved in my parts are all bound up. But what grows out of that is that sense of that, also that background chant, the Latin rosary, the, the French voices of summons, the, 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 the and then, and then uh, submitting himself uh, trustfully to the hands of these strangers who one hand on front, one hand on the back, then take him back down. The, the bind will leave and he's under that cold, cold water back up again and that's, that's it. But he's been brought, I mean, that, it's not just his parts that have been wrapped up in that white cloth, it seems to me, because he, he also says that the water, you know, there's this thing about magic, the, the, the mystery of, of what water can achieve. The rhythm of the voices, human part there, and the river seem to reassemble my life around me. I mean, what do we seek um, if we go on pilgrimage, particularly to Lords, we're, we're, we're seeking if we're sincere, quite often our own healing, discovering our own integrity or reconnecting with our integrity. Um, wholeness of life it's not just um, uh, physical healings but emotional mental spiritual healing of and the greatest healing any of us can 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 uh, receive first of all is to accept and love ourselves and then through that love express our love to others and then our love of God this is Jesus this is the golden rule treat others as we would want to be treated ourselves. 
So, Sean, I think what I said at Mass tonight, I don't know what this bit was messed about with, but I see God's grace at work in a life like Sean's, no less, perhaps even more, than in my life as a sort of official minister of religion. Sean has, has managed to bring things together. He, he, he connects, he connects religion at his best. Religion means bind together, brings things together. Sean has done that so, so, so with such great craft, great sincerity, great um, mastery of, of language. But in doing so, he's, he's reconnecting um, himself the world, those who are willing to walk with him, connecting us to, 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 to understanding ourselves that bit better and accepting ourselves that bit better. So as I say, a good poet, a good artist connects, whereas so many of us find it necessary to compartmentalise our lives because there are aspects we're, we're too ashamed of, we're, we're unsure about the reception in, in communities, in families. Well, here's a young man as brave as any I uh, have witnessed in terms of this kind of aspect of life. And I want to pay tribute to Sean and to his family um, to say that to my mind, you're, I've always been and always will be a part of, of our, our community, wherever you happen to be. I wish you well, I wish you joy, I wish you fulfillment. I wish you the respect you, and acceptance and understanding that you, like any of us, are, are due. And I wish to hear so much more of your gift crafted into poems and the like. And I went on from that to sort of draw a point about the disciples on that road and how um, they struggled to accept what was going on in their lives. They were running away from something. They were unsure. They were despondent, downcast. They were even, you know, they were just trusting any sort of thing that they'd heard. They just witnessed. They thought they'd witnessed the end. Whereas, in fact, it was a beginning. And it was only in that moment of, of insight at the breaking of the bread that they realised that and their joy began to be unlocked. And then shared. And then travelled two centuries on, two, sorry, two millennia on, we're still hearing their witness. And I had completed it then with a quote about sacramentalism, um, not being, as I say, just magic, putting together words and actions and grace, and although it does, I do know my sacramental theology that way, but the proper understanding of sacramental is so, so let down by, by the way we sometimes interpret the church and just link into the the, 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 the formula of words, the action, the person delivering it, and that put, invests far too much um, 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 power in, in the clergy, um, and to my mind. So let me finish, let me give a quote that I also used this evening, which was from Daniel O'Leary, who, Daniel O'Donnell, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Daniel O'Leary, um, priest, who, who, who lived a bit on the edge, I think, um, but again, spoke so beautifully and eloquently about sacramental vision. He wrote, writes, sacramental vision is achieved not just with new spectacles, but with new eyes. Sacramental vision embraces what is there and intensifies its meaning. Sacramental vision celebrates reality and exposes its true nature. It diminishes nothing, only enhances everything. That is the artist's gift to integrate, to bring together to celebrate reality, to expose its true nature, to get under the skin 
uh, true art doesn't destroy actually it never diminishes anything it, it it enhances everything it gives a voice to the voiceless and again I'm it's like a eulogy this short if you ever get to see this but I'm just so grateful and then at the end of mass uh, we, we've been hearing uh, this, the, the, the words of the um, the Matrix Blessed place and the verse particularly I'm going to comment on was Christ be in all hearts thinking about me Christ be in all minds sorry Christ be in all hearts thinking about Christ be in all tongues telling of me Christ be the vision in eyes that see me in ears that hear me Christ ever be in the point I, 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 I uh, wanted us all to, to consider is that if we are to be the kind of Christian community to which we all aspire and all want to belong and all contribute to, incidentally, don't let me suggest otherwise, but it's a collective effort and it's a collective uh, journey uh, and a collective yearning to, 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 to see Christ in each other and to set aside all, all uh, prior sometimes um, prejudices or what we opinions sometimes have to be rethought, reshaped, new insights learned, discovered, received as gift. And um, to my mind, Sean deserves acknowledgement for being somebody who, as I say, has helped me um, to, 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 to speak to you in this way. Um, those of you who care to to listen and um well there we have it thank you sean and uh, so proud of you and your family uh, your mum your brothers your nan and all those who've supported you and i wish you